Hi folks, thanks for joining us for our Safety and Health Magazine webcast on the NFPA 70E changes. We're gonna give our audience just a minute to settle in and we'll start the presentation shortly. Thank you. Thanks again for joining today, folks. We'll start the presentation shortly. We're just gonna give folks just a moment to settle in. Thank you. Hello everyone and welcome to today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast, NFPA 70E Standard Updates, sponsored by Bulwark FR and eHazard. My name is Barry Botino and I'm an Associate Editor at Safety and Health. I'll be serving as the moderator for today's event. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items to share with everyone. As a disclaimer, the views of today's speaker and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or a publication does not mean the council or the magazine endorses those items. After today's presentation, we'll conduct a Q&A with our speaker. If you have a question, just click on the Q&A button located at the bottom of the screen, type your question, and press the send button. You don't have to wait for the Q&A to begin to send your questions. We welcome those at any time during today's event. After this presentation, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, but I'll tell you more about that a little later. This webcast will be archived. If you want to view this presentation or any of our past webcasts, please go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. Now let's introduce our speaker. With us today is Zahir Juma. Zahir is a partner at eHazard, and he conducts nationwide electrical safety training and arc flash studies. He joined eHazard US after 10 years of managing eHazard South Africa. He is regarded as an arc flash safety specialist for his work convening and chairing SANS 724, which is the South African national standard for personal protective equipment and protective clothing against the thermal hazards of electric arc. He has also done extensive research and been published on arc flash incident investigations and how to implement them in industry. Again, we thank you all for tuning into this presentation. Zahir, when you're ready, please take it away. Thank you so much, Barry, and great to have you all here. You know, um, it, it's great to be talking to you all again if you've joined us um, previously. You know, sometimes between these webinars that we have with safety and health, it feels like, gosh, it's been a while. And sometimes it's like, hey, didn't we do one of these like just yesterday? So um, it's that time of the year again where we've got to be discussing 2024 changes. And what you would realize is that I don't think ever that we've done one of these in September. We usually do them around November, December. So one of the big things that happened was because of the review process with the NFPA um, 70E cycle and the amount of comments that came in after the changes, uh, because they were so few, they were able to expedite the process. There's a lot more to be said about it, but what they were able to do was they were able to get the standard published electronically much earlier. I'm going to go so far as saying probably about six months earlier than they normally would. Now, one of the big questions we have, and I'm sure you are going to ask me this question, is when do you all have to comply with the standard and make the necessary changes and stuff? Um, Let's let's get that towards let's let's park that question until the end of the presentation, because once you start looking at what these changes were, I think you might have uh, a change of mind on how quickly you need to adopt these uh, so, some of these changes. Some of them you will need to, others um, not necessarily. So we'll jump into more details on those in in a little bit, folks. So. 
Let's start off quickly with, and I always do this in every single one of my presentations, I always make sure that we cover the electrical hazards because it's pointless talking about NFPA 70E if folks don't have a basic understanding of what the electrical hazards are. So what is NFPA 70E? It's basically a standard that's trying to control or trying to align work practices in such a manner that minimizes harm to the worker and damage to equipment, right? So worker safety is obviously paramount. And the way it does it is through several iterations. And we'll get to some of those uh, throughout today's discussion. But the big thing that people think about when they think NFPA 70E, the first thing that comes to their mind is electrical arc flash. And folks, this is not true. You know, the, the way the standard has been written, I see it focusing on electrical shock protection first and foremost. And you've got to understand what is electrical shock before you understand, before we even start talking about electrical arc flash. Electrical shock is any incident or any event that causes current to pass through a worker's body or a person's body. If I have current passing through my body, I am experiencing a level of shock. Now, electric shock can be of of, um, of, of a magnitude that can be felt by the human body. So that is, uh, that is what we call the sensation threshold or the threshold of sensation. And in other cases, you could have current pass through your body and you might not even feel it. So for example, um, if you have like a double A battery and if you hold that double A battery between your fingers, believe it or not, there is an infinitesimally small amount of current that's passing through your body. But are you experiencing shock? No, you're not. Take that same hand and stick it in the uh, receptacle. No, I'm not saying do this. Please don't do this. <laughs> but uh, if you take that same hand and accidentally stick it into an electrical outlet in your home, all of a sudden it's like, wow, I felt that. And if your house has any semblance of a good safety system, you should trip the electrical breaker at your distribution panel and you should walk away safely. If you do come into contact with this unintentionally and you don't walk away from it, well, it's either you've got a very old house that was not brought up to code, or um, I would seriously consider investing in another electrician. All right, so um, that is electric shock. Now, electric shock doesn't necessarily mean that you got to touch the electrical panel, you got to touch the uh, receptacle in your home to receive an electrical shock. No, no, no. In certain instances, we have higher voltages. And once you reach a certain point, that voltage is strong enough to break down air and jump onto your body, all right? And when it does that, it basically uh, breaks down the air, the air becomes a conductor, and you are then connected to the electrical system via that air gap, and you will experience shock. Now, that brings us to the topic of arc flash. Arc flash generally occurs when you've got a voltage uh, potential where the uh, magnitude of the voltage is high enough that it breaks down the air. And when you break down the air, you get an electrical short circuit. Now, all of us have seen electrical arc flash before. Lightning between the cloud and the ground, once that voltage becomes high enough, it breaks down the air. Similarly, in your workplace, um, you could have faulty equipment you could have somebody that's using an uh, uninsulated tool that bridges to electrical conductors, for example, or reduces the air gap between them by dropping like a wrench, dropping a screwdriver, dropping a, a washer or a screw in between them. You reduce the volume of air, you remove the air strength between those conductors and boom, those conductors break down the air and there you have an arc flash. So unlike electrical shock, arc flash doesn't have to enter your body. What arc flash is, is basically a thermal event. So it's very, very high temperatures. And that is enough to ignite your non-arc rated clothing. Now, together with the thermal aspect of it, occasionally we get an arc blast, which is a pressure event. But the pressure event as well is limited to different types of equipment. So for your average, type of motor control centers, panel boards, distribution panels. Um, some of the newer research shows that 
it's highly unlikely that arc blast is going to be a consideration. However, there are other equipment like capacitors where arc blast does does become a consideration. All right. So with that, um, I have, I've got a little video here. I'm not going to play the video for you, but basically what this video shows is um, perhaps the grounding on the circuit wasn't fast enough um, or wasn't set up correctly. But what happens here is that the casing becomes energized. And as a person's holding onto the casing, you can see their thumb uh, on the right hand is kind of stuck inside the panel. And what happens here is that they basically bridge the circuit from one hand to the other hand, right? And then you have current pass through their body. Now people say, oh, it's hand to hand. This person's definitely gonna die. No folks, even if this was from his right hand to his right elbow, remember you've got blood and plasma throughout your entire body. Once a current enters your body, it's going to travel through your entire body. It's not just gonna be limited to that one area. So that is why we say when a person receives electrical shock, it is very, very, very crucial that that person gets checked out. And one of the topics that is not part of today's presentation, but we should seriously talk about it, is our workforce, our contractors, our electricians, getting them to report these near miss events. Because sometimes a person gets a shock and they just brush it off. I'm perfectly fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, nothing happened. And then they move out and then later that evening, you find them dead. And what happens here? It's when a person receives electric shock, the body tries to compensate for it by um, releasing some hormones from your kidneys, from your pituitary gland. And what those hormones tend to do is they put our body into like um, protection mode. But unfortunately, when it comes to electric shock, the body kind of goes out of whack and can secrete certain enzymes that have a bearing on the heart muscle. And what would happen is after receiving this electrical shock, maybe four, five, six hours later, you have such a high concentration of this enzyme around your heart muscles without you even realizing this, and your heart just stops, your, your ticker just goes off, all right? So uh, rem re remember, create this culture, 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 very important. I'm going to talk to you about it in, in, in a little bit. All right, so um, arc flash. This little video basically shows a current that moves through the uh, line and flashes through the worker, ignites the clothing on the inside and results in burns. This was an accident uh, scene recreation that we had um, created for a client and very, very interesting. We've got a paper published on this, by the way. So folks, before I get to this slide, um, I realized that I just jumped into the presentation today very coldly <laughs> and uh, didn't do my sort of social introduction that I normally do. So um, one of the things I want to do is first and foremost say thank you to all of you for joining us this, this afternoon. And I know all of you are busy reading the slide and not listening to me, but um, today's class is all about the 70E updates. All right. And uh, I know all of you are signed in here. You're eager to know what are the updates? What do I need to change in my program and all of that? But I want to uh, ask you for two things um, as a huge favor, huge favor to me, two things, right? First and foremost, I'd like to hear from you. What would you like to hear about? So drop me a comment because one of the things that I do is as people talk to me, as we investigate ac accidents, I come up with topics and I present those topics at the Safety and Health webinar. What I wanna hear from you is what are the topics that you would like to hear specifically within electrical safety? It can be low voltage, it can be high voltage, it can be industrial safety, it can be utility safety, I don't care. The question is, what are you interested in and what would you like to hear? I've got a list of about uh, 10 topics that I've already got parked uh, to cover next year in webinars and stuff, but I'm always keen to know what is your concern at the moment? What is industry feeling? What are your thoughts? What are the areas that is a blind spot for you that you need um, more, more information on? The second thing that I'd like to ask you to do is what other questions do you have with regards to electrical safety? Not specifically NFPA 70E. It can be the new maintenance standard, NFPA 70B. It can be the National Electrical Code questions. It can be NFPA 70E questions. It can be OSHA, OSHA related questions, uh, OSHA construction related questions. So feel free to drop your questions in the post. Anything, anything, anything that, um, uh, that you want to know anything that we can answer today, 
I greatly appreciate that. All right, folks. So now here's here's what I want to do. I want to stop talking about NFPA 70E for a little while. All right. Many, many years ago, many, many years ago, there's a company and you must have heard of this company. The company's name is DuPont. <laughs> All right. Um, who, who, who hasn't heard of them, right? So um, this company very involved in explosives and taking the lead in terms of um, chemistry, integrating that into mechanical engineering, integrating that into electrical engineering as well. All right, and uh, what they were finding was at their factories themselves. Now, these are huge chemical plants, very complex process and stuff. They were seeing a lot of people being killed. But having this culture, having this um, uh, approach by the senior leaders, right, by the senior leaders, that we need to change this culture. We need to change this culture. So how do they go about changing this culture? And I know what you all are thinking. You all are probably thinking, oh, they wrote watertight procedures. Yeah, 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 that's what they did. Oh, and then they spent a ton of money on training everybody and all of that. And folks, you all think about it, right? I want you to look at this and I'm gonna move my mouse here. Barry told me not to move my mouse too much across the screen. It's very distracting. So apologies, Barry. <laughs> but if you look at this um, little uh, graph that I've got here on the right-hand side, and if you look at electrical shock, man, I don't know about you, but I can hardly even see that little sliver there. Okay, and just for those of you who are health conscious, uh, that's not the slice of pie that you need to be eating, okay? Especially if it's derby pie around Kentucky Derby time. Um, nope, all right, so yeah, the slice of pie should be like the blue color, that's, that's, that's delicious. All right, so looking at this red, electrical shock and burn, it's nothing. Why, why is this important to you? Because if it's nothing, you're not gonna get money to, to, to improve on it right? If it's this tiny, it's going to end up on the back burner because you've got more important things to worry about. You've got people working at heights, you've got vehicles um, and there's traffic collisions, you've got uh, confined spaces, hazardous locations, you've got all of that that's vying for your attention. Why would you care about electrical safety? And here is the problem. Electrical safety has an extremely low frequency, extremely low frequency. In fact, most of you sitting here and listening to me today, you'll probably only have one incident, one incident maybe once every five years, once every 10 years. The problem with it is that single incident, once that incident occurs, okay, this is where we are killing people, we are causing disabling injuries, we are damaging our equipment, folks. Pre-pandemic, if I placed an order for um, um, for a stock standard 90 amp fuse, I would be able to get it off the shelf, all right? If I needed uh, a 400 amp breaker, I could just get it off the shelf. Somebody would be able to drive it out to me later this afternoon. Today, I need to wait three months to sometimes, I've got a client of ours who's waiting nine months for their replacement equipment to arrive. All right. So once you start damaging equipment, hey, a lot of our factories rely on electricity, don't have electricity. Guess what? Nothing else matters. Why? Plant is not running. Everyone's standing around and twiddling their thumbs because there's nothing else you can do. Right. So what did DuPont do? DuPont approached this very differently. DuPont said, instead of getting to a compliance based structure to say that thou shall do this, thou shall do that, thou shall do this. Instead of doing that, what they did was they approached the company safety culture. And by altering the culture to be a risk-based culture instead of a compliance-based culture, they actually changed the way that people think. So it doesn't matter who you are. You can be uh, the CEO of a particular um, uh, plant of theirs or you can be um, one of the electricians on the equipment, you can be a plant operator, you can be the custodial staff. Safety is ingrained in the way people think. Whether I'm leaving my uh, mop out in a corner, whether I'm opening a door and closing a door, I'm thinking, is there somebody else on the other side of that door? When I'm standing next to that door, can somebody open the door up to me, right? And that is where you move out from a compliance-based culture. So although we're doing the NFPA 70E changes, I want to ask you this question. I want to ask you this question, all right? Do you have that mindset? And if you don't have that mindset, how are you influencing others to build that mindset, okay? Next question I have for you. What can you do to change from this compliance-based mindset to a risk 
risk-based mindset, okay? Risk needs to be in almost everything and risk mitigation, risk control needs to be in every single thing we do. Folks, the good news is since 1993, they brought down their fatalities down to zero, okay? They have not had a fatality since then, and they may have had some serious incidents, um, but do you know, if they had not changed the organizational culture, we wouldn't be in this place talking about this. All right, so let's jump into NFPA 70E changes now. I know you all have been waiting for this patiently. So this year, the changes have been very minimal. However, some of those minimal changes did have a big impact. Let's run through them quickly. This is a summary of everything, all right? After you see uh, slide number nine, you've got the entire presentation. I'll spend the rest of the afternoon there jumping into each one of this. One of the first things that they had was job planning must include in an emergency response plan. So emergency response, I want you to think about this as being prepared for emergency. So when our company writes procedures and we go out and we help improve existing procedures for companies, we don't call it an emergency response plan. We call it emergency preparedness. And emergency preparedness means you do two things. Number one, you plan for the worst outcome, okay? Hopefully it never materializes. Um, number one is you plan for the worst outcome and you put in control measures. The second thing that you do is you test your planning. So don't wait for somebody to get shocked. Actually have a planned uh, emergency response drill where you enact the situation and look at how people respond. All right, so that's a point that I'm going to make on that. Then there's refinement and addition to the electrically safe work condition, ESWC, electrically safe work condition. What eHazard is now mandate, not mandating, is strongly suggesting to folks is that please stop calling it de energize, please stop calling it lotto, all right, because each one of those misses something else. If you say de-energize, well, you haven't tested and verified. If you say lock out and tag, yeah, you've locked out and tag, but did you ground? Um, so we have questions like that. The term that covers it all is an electrically safe work condition. There's a new Annex S called Assessing the Condition of Maintenance. We're gonna have a nice laugh about this a little while uh, when I get to that slide. And now all the definitions have been updated to include uh, the NEC requirements, all right? You read that in the previous slide that I put up and the verification of absence of voltage at each point of work. So that was a major one, the verifications of absence of voltage at each point of work. Shock and approach boundaries have changed. Oh my gosh, and talk about being sciencey and nerdy and um, lacking um, or just lacking, not being pragmatic, right? So we'll talk about the non-leather protectors. I don't know if you folks remember, but um, I think it was probably about two or three years ago, just towards the tail end of the pandemic, uh, where Hugh Hoagland and I did an entire webinar on ASTM uh, F3258 on the uh, non-leather protectors and arc testing of them. And then we very quickly talk about the new hazard thresholds in chapter three, um, marginal, marginal changes, but uh, interesting changes. And then we'll talk about all of the organizational changes. So there are three types of changes that you will find in the document. You've got meaningful, minor, and refinement. Refinement is the easiest. It just means that because I had to change things around or maybe things didn't flow too well, we've reorganized everything. Minor simply means that um, maybe there were some editorial changes. Maybe things were uh, just kind of explained a little more. Maybe a note was deleted because it was kind of putting on blinders on people. All right, and then you get the meaningful. Meaningful means that uh, this, this is something that you've got to do. It's got to make a change in your written program. There's got to be change that's got to come through in the training. So this is the uh, retraining period now where you've got to get all of this meaningful changes, which includes new information as well. All right, so folks, remember to drop those questions and I'm really looking forward to what questions you have. All right, so the job safety planning requirement. Now, this seems like a very simple step, emergency response plan. All the others were always there. You needed to have your job description. What am I going to do? And you need to break those down into your steps. Let's use a silly example. Uh, I've got a bus plug 
And on the bus plug, I've actually, a bus plug is the little box that connects us on, that connects onto the bus way, right? Or the, um, uh, the bus ducting, right? And the plug is what connects onto it. And then you have a cable that drops from that. So let's assume I've got a fuse that's being damaged on that bus plug. Now, what is the job description? The job description is a replacement of the failed fuse and troubleshooting if there were any other issues because the fuse uh, blew for a reason. What's the reason that the fuse blew? So that's gonna be the job description. What are the individual tasks? The individual tasks are gonna be first and foremost, try and create an electrically safe work condition from the plug downstream so that my work does not cause any harm to anybody downstream. Then uh, create an electrically safe work condition on the bus ducting so that it's safe for me to work into in that bus plug. Then how am I gonna open that bus plug? Does it take, um, does the lever need to be in the off position? Do I need any specific tools? Are you all getting the difference between a job description and delineating your individual tasks? Those are two different things. Now, it's not your job description, interestingly, it's your individual tasks that leads you to the identification of the hazards, right? Because your tasks are going to give birth to these hazards. These hazards can only be two. They're either going to be electrical arc flash or they're going to be electrical shock. What is the hazard? Now, once you've got the hazard, you're going to go through that risk assessment process in like, okay, shock hazard here at this distance, okay, when I get in here, I need to be insulated, I need to use rubber gloves, I need to have um, EH rated footwear, I've got to probably stand on an insulating mat. If you all work at high voltage, you all are power utilities, you're probably talking about equipotential zone creation, you're talking about grounding. And then the last bit is, is there an existing procedure that tells me how to change the fuse on this bus plug? Is there any um, chances of feedback? What are the two points that I'm gonna create an electrically safe work condition on my bus duct before I go and I work in that little bus plug? And then finally you get to emergency response. So your emergency response, what happens if you come across um, and an unknown situation that arose only when you access the equipment. What do you do? Obviously, that's a trick question and statement. Obviously, you need to stop work, right? Because change of scope means you need to go and re-identify your hazards. You've got a change of scope, okay? So hopefully none of you fell for that, all right? <laughs> then the next thing I'm gonna do, what happens if somebody gets shocked? What happens if somebody falls next to the ladder and they're still in contact with the ladder? What happens if somebody is hung on, right? And cannot let go of the circuit? What happens if there's an electrical arc flash? What happens if the person was not using arc rated cloth cl clothing? What happens if we have lights out? Because usually when you have an electrical arc flash, you're gonna lose lighting as well, right? So you've got all of those concerns. Well, yes, what are you doing about all of those? All right. Um, other factors that you got to take into consideration is your emergency response plan. Now, sorry, in your emergency response plan is your human performance tools. Okay, this is Annex Q of your NFPA 70E. So what you also have to factor in, we've seen this, folks. I know you're not going to believe me, or some of you may, 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 may believe me, but this is what we see. What we see is people have the best of plans, and then you have the incident. And as soon as you have the incident, everybody's running in all directions. you got two types of people. One group is going to walk straight in and grab this person and try to rescue them in the event, end up being shocked and killed as well. And you have the other group that's going to forget every single training and every single protocol that was in place before. OK, so you've got to factor this human performance um, uh, aspects into your emergency prepared plan, preparedness. And what you've got to do is make sure that you try trial and error, trial and error until you get it right. OK, have emergency drills, emergency drills. We do emergency drills for everything. Why don't we do it for electrical safety? And I don't know. All right. Um, when I was still an employee and I still had a boss and I was still working for I'm, 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 I've still got a boss. I'm still working for someone. <laughs> but I mean, when I was in industry, um, we had several electrical drills. All right. So what's new is a condition for normal operating condition, condition for normal operating condition. OK, so the normal operating condition exists when and here's a big one. They've added rated for the available fault current. And you all are probably thinking, oh my gosh, what does this mean? <laughs> all right. What this means is 
when you buy a panel board, you all have these panel boards in your garages, you have them in your factories, you have motor control centers, you have control panels, and all of these, according to the NEC and the um, some of the UL standards, because UL is one of the um, accreditation um, authorities in the US for listing equipment safe for use in electrical applications. And there's several UL standards and the NEC that actually tell you that you need to determine what the short circuit current is. That means if you have to let current flow through this equipment under fault condition, what is the absolute maximum current that this equipment is going to be able to withstand before you get mechanical and or thermal damage to the equipment? Now, this is very important, folks, because sometimes you may get mechanical damage on the inside of the equipment that still allows the equipment to function until... I go out and try to switch that piece of equipment and by the third or fourth switching operation, this thing fails and then everybody looks at like, oh my gosh, what did this worker do wrong? All right. And um, in the meantime, it's basically having over dutied your equipment. So what am I talking about? Okay. I, to, don't worry, folks. It's not you. Sometimes I also wonder. Um, <laughs> right. So what, what we're talking about here is Sometimes you have a transformer, okay? And a transformer will feed a panel board. And let's say this is a 45 uh, kVA transformer. It's a little transformer of a particular rating. And somebody in our organization comes through and say, hey, we've got this $500,000 uh, saving initiative. We're gonna change all of our transformers. We're gonna put in high efficiency transformers. We're gonna remove all of our uh, old lighting and we're gonna put in a um, newer type of lighting that's LED based, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and they make these changes to the system. But nobody actually goes in and looks at the overall impact that those minor changes have on the macro electrical system. Now, let's say you have a panel board that's rated for 10,000 amps short circuit current, and you are feeding this off a, let's say, of a 30,000, uh, sorry, a 30 kVA transformer. But by the by, somebody came and said, hey, this transformer is old, we're removing this transformer, we're putting a new transformer in, all right? And when they put that new transformer in, because it was a higher efficiency transformer, it actually provided more fault current. So previously, when you did an arc flash study and you calculated it, let's say you were at 9,000 amps, right? And 9,000 was your fault current. After you changed the transformer, you went to, let's say, 10,500. Guess what? You have now over -dutied that panel board because if a short circuit were to occur, per code, per IEEE, U, UL, and um, uh, the NEC, you are now over that equipment. And what NFPA 70E is now saying, well, you cannot call it normal operation if your equipment is over -dutied. Now, you all are probably thinking, well, how do I determine whether my equipment is over or not? The only way that you can do that is through an engineering study. This is where you model your entire electrical network of your plant, doesn't matter how big or how small your plant is. And then you look at the equipment that you have installed and you look at the available fault current. Now, folks, you all are probably thinking, no, I've got a good handle on my equipment and my people and I know exactly what work everyone is doing. The reality of it is it may not be you. It may be the utility that changes their system that causes this fault current to uh, be exceeded, the, the rated fault current of your equipment, all right? Now, I know while I was talking, everybody else read these slides, but uh, if we need to circle back to that a little later, we can do that. All right, so the electrically safe work condition exceptions. Folks, what I'm gonna do is, I'm actually gonna skip this slide because I've got another slide where I can actually talk about this. But um, the one thing I will say here is, Previously, NFPA 70E, so if you look at the 2018 version, the 2018 version, and I've got the 2018 version here in front of me, and I'm just turning to that page very quickly. What it had was under Article 110.3, it said an electrically safe work condition. And what it said was that whenever, whenever you are inside the limited approach boundary, right, the limited approach boundary, remember the limited approach boundary is 42 inches for low voltage. 
So they said if you get to within 40, uh, 42 inches of any exposed energized conductors, whether you plan on touching this, inspecting it, working, no, it doesn't matter. If you get to within 42 inches of low voltage system, 600 volts and below, then uh, an electrically safe work condition needs to be established. That means that you need to follow all of your steps for your control of hazardous energy, your lockout tagout programs, your de-energizing programs. And we spoke about that. Um, that is where you're basically going to identify all of your energy sources, shut down the operation, open your disconnects, lockout tag. Um, then you're going to assure that your contacts are open visually if possible. You are then going to inspect your test equipment, make sure you're using appropriate test equipment. You're going to then test for the absence of voltage. Uh, sorry, you're first going to verify that your meter is operational. You're then going to test both phase and line voltage for the absence of voltage. You're going to re-verify that your meter is still operational. All right, and then you are going to uh, apply grounds if necessary. For low voltage, we generally don't apply grounds, right? But if it's high voltage, then you would go out and apply grounds. So that is how you create your electrically safe work condition. The other instance where your electrically safe work condition had to be created was when you have an arc flash hazard. Arc flash hazard is when you're interacting with the equipment or if there's a shock hazard. So where there's a shock hazard, there's an arc flash hazard. Or if you're interacting with the equipment, that's typically when you would need to create an electrically safe work condition. So that was covered under, under Article 110.3. Then Article 110.4, they went out and they said, well, we will permit energized work, by the way. So 110.3 says energized work is not permitted. And then 110.4 says, well, energized work is permitted under these. So you've got these two 110.3 and 110.4 that were contradicting each other. So what they basically did was they took 110.3, the uh, electrically safe work condition, and they put in 110.4 as exemptions to the electrically safe work condition. But this had some unintentional um, uh, consequences and, and we'll talk about them in a little while. Now, one of the new things, and I am so excited that this is included in there because one of the big things I believe in is, um, you know, you take care of your body, you're gonna reap the benefits of it later in life. Similarly, I firmly believe that if you take care of what you own, you're gonna get a good return on investment from your purchase. But I don't just think about this at home for the things that I own. I also think about this for the places that I work at. So when you buy a piece of equipment, whether you're spending 50 bucks on it or whether you're spending 10 million on it, I don't care. All right, if you maintain it correctly, if you take care of this equipment, it's gonna return your investment, but more importantly, it's not gonna hurt anybody. All right, so they have now expanded into Annex. Uh, Annex S is brand new. Okay, sweet. Um, brand new, and it's going to be assessing the condition of maintenance. So they talk about, about the risk assessment, about looking at your overall um, equipment or asset base. What are your key, your critical equipment? That means if this equipment trips, boom, I'm going to shut down the entire plant. All right. What is your bottleneck equipment? So you first identify those pieces of equipment. The next question you have is, well, what do I need to do on those pieces of equipment? All right. And then they say, in addition to the manufacturer's recommendations, here are some visual inspections that you can perform, periodic testing and inspection. Um, if, if, it is, if it is a high uh, impact piece of machinery, then um, maybe it's exposed to electrical stresses, mechanical stresses, chemical stresses. On all of those, you can have, uh, uh, point five says, you can have permanent, permanently installed monitoring. Now, folks, in high voltage cables, more and more folks are going towards permanently installed partial discharge monitoring on high voltage cables. Those are the kind of things that they're talking about. They're talking about having temperature sensors on the inside of the equipment. So if you get a temperature fluctuation, that it alarms and you can go and look at it. Predictive technique, some of your predictive maintenance is going to be... Um, uh, looking at your oil analysis, et cetera, et cetera, keeping a log of uh, maintenance that you've performed on that equipment, all right? So that's basically what that uh, annex is covering. So this is, this is becoming a big one because boy, oh boy, have batteries blown up like everywhere across the world. Uh, no, bad choice of words. Um, have they mushroomed, right? 
Um, they basically mushroom throughout the world and it's this lithium ion drive. It's like, man, it's, it, it's everywhere. Do you know from the time they brought it into our cell phones? Do you remember it changed things? Remember before we had to like plug our phones in, keep it in all the time. Now, if you forget to charge it one night, who cares, right? Why? It's all because of the benefits of lithium ion. But unfortunately, with lithium ion, you can't get something like a free lunch. So with the good comes the bad as well, right? And sometimes the downright ugly. But um, here's the thing. Here's the thing. NFPA 70E wasn't focusing on lithium ion batteries specifically. What their standard covers was batteries and battery rooms. So if you have like very large equipment and uh, you have like a DC backup for like tripping circuit breakers, if you have them for process, those are the types of batteries that they're talking about. Now, if you looked at your previous table 130.4E, which spoke about your shock hazards, there were two tables. There was a table A and a B. Table A spoke about your AC. It spoke about your um, limited and restricted approach boundaries. And then you had the DC table, which was B, that spoke about your limited and restricted approach boundaries for DC. DC stands for direct current. And direct current doesn't only come from batteries. You could also get direct current from a rectified circuit. So you've got a utility power. And from the utility power, you rectify and you get your DC, your AC to DC, right? So what they were talking about here was uh, batteries and battery rooms. They change that threshold from 50 to 100 volts, okay? And um, so here's what they're saying. What they are saying is that it is very simple. The tables tell you that 50 volts is your threshold for electrical shock. So as soon as you have 50 volts, you need to protect, you need to have risk control strategies to protect against electrical shock. But for batteries and battery rooms, what they are saying is that when your battery voltages start exceeding 100 volts with a short circuit power of one kilowatt or more, they are saying that safety through design becomes imperative. That once you exceed these thresholds, that obviously, 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 you still have to take care of your safety, your human safety, your personnel safety, the programs, the training, the auditing, et cetera, et cetera. But there's another element to it as well, all right? So normally what they found was batteries below uh, 50 volts, um, batteries, sorry, at around that 50 volt to 100 volt, they didn't see too much action happening in terms of um, arc flash in terms of causing like um, uh, breakdown in terms of um, exposing persons to arc flash as well. And so they upped that threshold from 50 to 100 volts and it allowed them a lot more liberty within some of the battery rooms to be able to do more work. And folks, the same principle appears in Article 340. It was the same requirement. For those of you who are seriously interested in this, please drop us a message. There's a fantastic IEEE paper. It was presented at the Electrical Safety Workshop, the IEEE Electrical Safety Workshop. For those of you who want to expand your knowledge, there's two conferences I strongly recommend that you attend. One is the National Safety uh, Council, the NSC Expo and Conference. They have the uh, regional conferences, but the national conference is definitely worth attending. That's gonna be one. And then the second one that I'm gonna strongly recommend is the Electrical Safety Workshop. It's called the IEEE Electrical Safety Workshop or abbreviated ESW, Electrical Safety Workshop. And there, there's several tutorials, there's several experts who, I mean, most of the, in fact, I think all of the people who sit on NFPA 70E and write this NFPA 70E standard and um, vote on this NFPA 70E standard are actually attending this conference as well. So you get to meet them and you get to talk to them as well. All right. And so um, there's a very good paper that was published at, um, at that conference with regards to DC, with regards to... Um, uh, safety around DC as well. You know, I'm just paging through my NFPA 70 ebook. There's a there's a group they called FCOG, and they are within the Department of Energy, and they've done some great work. And they've got a handbook, a DOE handbook. And I've just forgotten what the number of that DOE handbook was. And I'm sure someone's going to remember that and drop it um, uh, in the message right now. But if you give me a second, if you give me a second, I know exactly where that reference was. It's the DOE handbook 
And it is on the standard, yeah. It's a DOE handbook 1092 for electrical hazard thresholds. Department of Energy DOE electrical safety handbook uh, 1092. And that covers um, a lot on electrical safety. Luckily, DOE information is available free of charge. So uh, we all love this, right? And uh, it's a great resource. Now, folks, very important. Uh, don't confuse these thresholds for you not having to use gloves and you not having to do um, any additional work like around batteries if you are above 50 volts but below 100 volts. No, not at all. OSHA still maintains that all voltages above 50 volts are hazardous. Okay, so please remember that. I want to say that in the context of the chapter three special requirements and special uh, for special equipment. So 310, 320, and 350, where they speak about the 100 volts, please don't misconstrue that with the shock thresholds. The shock thresholds are still 50 volts, hasn't changed. All right, let's run through some of the minor changes. You would see, and here's my mouse again. Do you remember folks uh, in the previous edition, this was 751 to 15 kV, 15 kV. It's now changed from 751 to 5 kV. And they went out and basically aligned their um, metric unit with their um, uh, SI units, not, not, not SI units, Imperial units. So I always forget it, all right? But, um, you know what I'm talking about, uh, feet and meters and stuff, right? And uh, in doing this, all right, this is Zahir Juma's personal opinion. This is not e-hazard. This is not NFPA 70E. But boy, oh boy, sometimes we get so stuck in engineering that we forget to be pragmatic and practical about this. Folks, the difference between 0.3 and 0.31 for the for the for the average engineer electrician instrument tech is this really gonna make a difference to them? Oh my gosh, I, I don't think so, all right? But it's a standard, you gotta be like kind of technically correct on it. And I don't mind that they've done that, but um, sometimes they make these difficult to read, right? Because r realistically in my life, I've never done three foot six inches. I've never done 42 inches, right? I normally take um, like one giant step which is going to probably push me closer to four feet. And that's going to be kind of the distance that I either barricade or post an attendant at, right? Depending obviously if the arc flash boundary is greater or not. That is what I've done practically, but hey, it's covered in here. I'm supposed to mention this to you and I mentioned it to you, all right? So um, I did my job and I'll uh, keep my opinions to myself and move on. All right, so creating the electrically safe work condition. All the slide is saying, Folks, have a read through the slide. All, all the slide is saying that it was there, then they moved it there, then they moved it again, and they did the cha-cha slide, and we all back where we started off, all right? So that's what happened there. That's what that slide is about. Now, there was an informational note here, and they found that this was extraneous um, kind of going on. There was a little bit more to, to, to this, but basically this concept is covered in the standard. So what they did was they deleted the informational note from creating an electrically safe work condition. And now, drum roll, this is where I wanted to talk to you about this, creating an electrically safe work condition. So what they say in the standard, and I'm going to speak about this very briefly, and we're going to start wrapping up now, is that... Um, is that you need to create an electrically safe work condition when you are exposed to a shock hazard or when you are exposed to an arc flash hazard. And then 110.4 basically went and said, well, if you're doing energized work, you're allowed to do energized work. If there's an increased risk of hurting more people, it's infeasible to create an electrically safe work condition. You're working less than 50 volts, so you've got a normal operating condition. Normal operating condition isn't really um, defined in NFPA 70E, but what they were trying to talk about was do you know turning a switch on, turning a switch off, starting a motor, stopping a motor, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And then um, racking is a bit of a hot topic, but for most people, racking generally uh, falls under type of operation. I don't think NFPA 70E will call racking normal operation, but um, uh, just between me and you in a public forum that's recorded and it's going to be all over the internet, um, I think racking can also be considered uh, normal operating, right? But for it to be called normal normal operating, there's several steps that are required. For example, you've got to make sure it's properly maintained per the manufacturer's instruction. Um, it is 
um, it's it, it, it's properly maintained, it's properly installed, there's no evidence of impending failure. If you put those three together, it means that it's got to look nice, it's got to smell nice, it's got to, uh, the temperature got to feel good, et cetera, et cetera, right? And you got to have maintenance records, those maintenance records have to be like best in class, et cetera, et cetera. And what they say then is that that leads to an operation table where they say if you've got a normal operating condition, it is unlikely that an arc flash is going to occur. Normal operating has nothing to do with electrical shock because normally when turning on, turning off something, you are not exposed to electrical shock. That is why racking becomes such a contentious issue because under certain conditions racking, you could be exposed to electrical shock, okay? Very, very minimal, but it is possible. So that is why normal operation doesn't have a shock element to it. It's just there for arc flash. Now, when it stood alone previously, like it did here, well, it had to be normal operation. And if you couldn't get normal operation, then you were supposed to create an electrically safe work condition, which meant that if this was my breaker that was used for lockout, tagout, and control of hazardous energy, I could not operate that breaker. I had to go upstream. And when I went upstream, it meant to work on this particular circuit. I had to switch off multiple circuits. Now what they've done is under the exceptions, so I'm looking at the right-hand side now, under exceptions, they've got normal operation as exception number one, then they've got the disconnect. So what they're saying is, and let me tell you, let me read this out to you very quickly, all right? Here, here, here it is, it says exception number two, an energized disconnecting means or isolating element shall be permitted to be operated to achieve an electrically safe work condition or to return equipment to service that has been placed in an electrically safe work condition. So what they're saying is that the exception to creating an electrically safe work condition, technically, theoretically, if you read this, now they're saying that even if it is not under normal operating, you can then operate it. However, here's the safeguard that they have in it, okay? They say the equipment supplying the disconnecting mean means or isolating element shall not be required to place be placed in an electrically safe work condition provided provided a risk assessment is performed and there is no unacceptable identified risk okay now let me tell you why this is good and bad this is good from a production point of view because now it means that you could take some safety interventions because the risk assessment right risk assessment means you've identified the problem areas and you are controlling that risk to a manageable level what this means that is that if I end up in court and if I have a really smart attorney out there, that attorney could simply ask me the question. So what you're saying is that let's say there's an arc flash hazard. Let's say we've got six calories per square centimeter, but we know that arc rated clothing is available. So if a person uses like a um, uh, minimum eight or minimum 12 calories per square centimeter protection from head to toe for an arc flash, right? Um, then even if an arc flash occurs, that technically speaking, that worker could be safe. And to answer that attorney, me as a subject matter expert, I'm gonna to have to say, practically you are correct, right? So what this is basically saying, and I, I firmly believe this was an unintended consequence, is now that for lockout tagout purposes, if you do a proper risk assessment and you are faced with these hazards that you can go ahead and operate this equipment without it being in normal operating condition, okay? And folks, you won't believe it. It's this one single point that caused me to include the safety culture slide in this presentation. Slide number three, where I covered the DuPont model in don't be a compliance-driven organization, be a risk-based organization. Because if we are explaining this to our workers in that way, if you have trainers who are explaining this, you know, people who are very academic, are not very practical, um, those type of trainers, you gotta be really careful of, all right? Um, where they come out and say, oh, but the standard allows you to do this. Folks, no, 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 no. Please do not let your workforce read it that way. Do not let them interpret it that way. I would keep this, this requirement in my back pocket for extreme emergencies. Otherwise, I would still go back and look at the upstream device and lock out, tag out, um, create an electrically safe work condition on my upstream device, all right? Now that every single person on this call is confused and has no idea what I'm talking about, let's move forward very quickly. So creating the electrically safe, uh, sorry, um, the electrical safety related work practices, you remember these were the elements that we used um, 
previously for creating uh, electrical safety, writing our electrical safety program, uh, performing our training and all of those, all of those numbers have changed and have been altered. All right, so that shouldn't affect you too much. The reason I'm mentioning this to you is because if your program made references, if your training material made references to certain numbers at the bottom, like we always do. So if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, we always have a reference. Well, when these references change, I want you to be aware of it and update it appropriately. So if you look at this presentation, all the notes are gonna be there. Um, you can use these, all right? They added, you got to verify at each point of work. It seems very good because what if there's backfeed? Now what they're saying is your verification is not only at um, your incoming anymore. You got to verify, verify at each point of work. Unfortunately, they haven't defined what each point of work is. So I'm thinking about the circuit um, where I've got maybe one incomer, but I've got 10 different loads. All right. Uh, that means you got to break the seal on every single motor terminal. You got to break the tape on each one to be able to measure and verify. I think that's also an unintended consequence. Labels were always durable. If you buy from a reputable supplier, labels were durable. They have a new requirement that they that where they say it must be durable to withstand the environment. OK, folks, this is why your five year review is so crucially important, because this is the opportunity to go back, check your arc flash labels to see which labels have been damaged, all right? As people walk by, tell them, if you see a label that's been worn out, bring it to my attention and we'll go back and we'll replace those labels, all right? So if you're not doing that regularly, remember 70E requires you to revisit your pro program once every five years. Okay, they adjusted the task and equipment labels. You can read through that. It's easy peasy, nothing too, too difficult. Folks, we've spent an entire webinar describing this. NFPA has removed the word leather from the context of leather over protectors. They now call it protectors. Reason being, you can now use cut resistant gloves. Many have, um, sorry, I say many, two companies have done R&D testing with our sister company for cut resistant over protectors. They haven't launched those products as yet. So they are still in the oven baking um, and I can't wait for this. I'm telling you in 10 years time, very few people are gonna be using rubber, uh, sorry, using leather over their rubber insulating gloves. Okay, it's all gonna be the cut resistant gloves. All right, folks, I'm gonna skip through the refinement section very quickly because it's just wording. Wherever they had shock, they added the word electric in front of it. Um, and here's a quick summary on the right-hand side that shows you all of the new references. For those of you who don't know about this, eHazard on their webpage has the electrical safety cycle that's built on the safety program, risk assessment, training, investigations, and audits and maintenance. And we do the plan, do, check, act. This is based on a postgraduate study. Um, and that table there on the right-hand side is the one that's most important to you. With that, I'm going to hand over to Barry for questions that you may have. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Zahir, for sharing your knowledge with us today. Before we start the q and I want to let everyone know about the evaluation survey that we're asking you to complete today. The survey will open in a different screen after this webinar, and your input is really important because it does help us to improve our future webcasts. So here we've had a great audience today. Lots of questions for you. We're going to run through as many as we possibly can here. Let's start with Scott, who asks, um, leather footwear, is it required PPE in the arc flash boundary and should it be provided by the company? Great question. So um, technically speaking, the standard changed during the last cycle to say that it doesn't have to be leather. Um, others can be used. We have tested few. Now, I want you to be very careful because these um, uh, cross trainers or uh, tennis shoes, as we call them, almost all of them that are steel toed at the moment will burn and melt. So I would avoid them. Personally, my preference has always been leather. Uh, but if you are using like safety tennis shoes inside the arc flash boundary, you gotta, gotta, gotta make sure that it meets the test requirements uh, and it has an arc rating on it. If it doesn't, please do not use it. We've tested those shoes and they do melt. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, Pam wants to know, will NFPA 70E in the future address high voltage DC with regards to lithium ion batteries for vehicles? 
You know, my thoughts are that that's most likely going to be a separate standard. There may be some references to that standard, but if you look at what they've done with Annex S, NFPA 70E cannot tell you thou shall go and use NFPA 70B for your maintenance requirements. They cannot tell you that because there's a NETA maintenance uh, and testing standard, there's a UL maintenance standards, there's the NFPA 70B standards, there's IEEE standards for maintenance. So it couldn't tell you which standard to use, but what it did in Annex S was it said that if you meet all of these requirements, or if you want to meet all of these requirements, well, the standard you should use is NFPA 70B, but they cannot tell you that directly. So they told you that indirectly by introducing Annex S. I believe that something similar is going to take place for lithium ion batteries in vehicles. And Pam, this was a great question because one of the very big areas now is lithium ion battery safety in EVs. There's another area called BESS, battery energy storage systems. Both of those battery energy storage systems and lithium ion batteries as used in electric vehicles um, and other mobile, mobile equipment, right? Because we're seeing so many of them. We're seeing cranes, we're seeing wood chippers, all of them, uh, forklifts, all battery operated these days. So NFPA 70E specifically excludes those. You can use their requirements as best practice, but uh, be aware that the standard does exclude uh, lithium ion batteries as used in electric vehicles. Great. Terry has a very important but a very quick question. When will the new version be released? Oh, it has been released. I'm actually, while I was training today, um, sorry, while, while I was talking to you all today, I was actually paging through and reading the references live. So I've got my book for about two months, maybe just more than two months already. And uh, folks, remember NFPA 70E, these changes are not mandatory changes, but they are best practice changes. So if your program is updated to 2021, you don't have to change to 2024 immediately, but I would strongly recommend that you please do update your written programs and your training programs. Great. And so here we have time for one more question today. That's going to come from Constance. And the question is, what precautions should be in place for personnel entering a high voltage electrical room who may not be working on electrical panels? Maybe they're walking through, performing an inspection, some janitorial work. Oh, my gosh. OK, so um, I know this is definitely not a quick question. Uh, Constance, why don't you shoot us an email, please, with this question and I'll get back to you. For the rest of you folks, um, for high voltage environments, OSHA is very clear that no uh, unqualified persons are allowed into this high voltage. Now you have high voltage utilities that fall under 1910.269. 1910.269 doesn't cover any unqualified person. So if I get in, if I take a person in there to pull weeds, for example, or to spray something to kill weeds, that person needs high voltage training that's appropriate to the hazards that they would experience. I'm not going to try and make them a high voltage technician, but I want to tell them that as, as in a high voltage environment, here's a thousand ways to die and here's how you can protect yourself from that happening. Great. We'll sneak okay. in one more before we go today. Uh, Jose asks, is 480 volts considered high voltage? Uh, no. Uh, OSHA does not state this clearly, but through reference, generally low voltage is considered 600 volts and below. All right. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, folks. Unfortunately, we have run out of time today. All of the unanswered questions will be forwarded along to Zahir so he can answer those at his, uh, as his time allows. Uh, we thank you all for attending today's presentation, and we appreciate you taking some time to share your feedback via our survey. A special thank you goes out today to our terrific presenter, Zahir Juma, and everyone from our sponsors, Bulwark FR and eHazard. This ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. Take care, everyone, and have a safe day.